Ruti, maybe. So it's 10 past, so we are going to launch your talk. Maybe you briefly introduce yourself because it's also very interesting to see all the various backgrounds of people who are doing research in crypto economics. And then I'm looking forward to your talk, which is called How to Engineer New Funding Mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, hello, I'm Shruti Apia. I'm going to be giving this talk on uh, engineering new funding mechanisms. I've been working on this project with Blocksteins. It's super interesting. I will be do doing like a more broader intro about health in my talk, so I'll actually just uh, share my screen so we can jump right in. Okay. Right. Can you see my screen now? Awesome. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about how to engineer new funding mechanisms. In particular, we're going to be talking about how to engineer outcome dependent funding mechanisms. So the ones that are dependent on the success of a particular bond or an asset or a um, security. So so and so. So um, we're going to be talking about that. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a systems design engineer by training. Uh, right now I'm working with block science on these risk adjusted bonding curves. I previously worked with um, Dapper Labs as well as Cosmos. Um, with Dapper Labs, I helped them de and develop the crypto economics for Flow blockchain. And with Cosmos, I helped build the Cosmos and Ethereum bridge, which is called Peggy. And before that, I was working with um, Consensus and Consensus Labs as well as Okta, all really fantastic um, teams and companies. So I want a little bit uh, motivate about essentially why uh, we're looking at complexity or economic systems in this way. So there's there's a very specific way in which um, we have a perspective of looking at economic systems, and that is in the perspective of the lens of complex systems. So um, complex systems are essentially systems which are nonlinear, chaotic, and have certain properties which are as follows. So the first property is that they are nonlinear and chaotic meaning that there is um, chaotic, meaning there's sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So in a lot of my previous talks also, I'm motivated for the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Basically, if you have complex system and you change even the littlest thing in initially, that will actually result in a compounding effect, which is a nonlinearity. And then, then it will actually manifest in a really, really large change in um, the future state of the system. So you can also think of this, I mean, colloquially it's known as a butterfly effect. So um, that might ring a bell for you. And then another thing about complex systems is that we really cannot um, deploy the approach of divide and conquer in these systems because um, if you divide and conquer, you, are, you aren't considering the interconnections between the different components or the different agents in, the, in a multi-agent system. So the connections really matter and that is something to be, um, something that actually causes very essential uh, phenomena in such systems. So connections matter a lot. Um, Typically, the reductionist approach of dividing and conquering, which is applied in like a lot of classical engineering systems, isn't um, very apt here. Um, and then, then we have uh, the property of um, how these systems always self-organize, and um, typically they self-organize into um, the most natural types of networks. And one of the most naturally appearing networks, most frequently um, appearing networks, is that of scale-free networks. So you can always see that these systems are always self-organizing because they are composed of autonomous agents, each of whom is making their own decision. And then we have the non-equilibrium property of these types of economic systems in the sense that these um, economic systems are never in a uh, equilibrium state. They're never constant. They're always in flux and they are always changing because there is inherent uncertainty within the system. And the inherent uncertainty within the system is caused due to the fact that each, each agent has a different internal model of the way they perceive the world. And that perception is um, constantly applied or imposed onto the system, um, therefore um, leading this to this like non-equilibrium non-equilibrium property where the system is constantly changing because the agents are constantly updating their own perceptions of the world. Okay, and so with this, I would like to talk more about um, this induction approach and the fact that agents have their own internal model of the system. So one way we actually think about this is um, how do we actually model uh, internal worlds of agents, right? And how do we actually um, utilize all of these properties and um, heed to all of these properties so that we can actually design systems in a classical engineering manner. 
So that's why we have economic systems engineering. This is something that, you know, block science practices. It's something that I practice a lot too with regards to applying the typical engineering design process into um, designing economic systems because economic systems are also inherently complex and we want to motivate for that and also take into consideration all the interconnections as well as all of your complexity properties. So the way we do go about this is first we um, take a download of the requirements. So um, the requirements being essentially the system requirements, functional requirements of the system, as well as what kind of system goals do we want to hope to achieve with this, um, with the system that we're trying to design. And then we have the system design part of it. This is when we are thinking about essentially how do we do mechanism design of, for the system, which is system design in, in the context of economics is typically mechanism design. So we have to go through a process of basically analytically verifying um, certain properties of the system, you know, reducing the dimensionality of the system so that we can simplify it and then arriving at a good, good enough algorithmic design so that we can apply it to a simulation, which is, takes us to our next st stage, which is with regards to validation. So when we want to validate, we need some tools to validate it. And typically the tools that we use to validate are um, simulations, because if you were to deploy something, deploy an economic system into the real world, that would actually be really, really cost intensive. So we, instead we use simulations. So typically I've been using agent-based models and simulations, but also there's like the CatCat -cat simulation, which is also an agent-based simulation, but it's based on a lot of like control systems properties and um, theories. So that will also be very, very interesting to check out. Um, so with regards to validation, what we want to do is we want to input a given, uh, given mechanism design, which we hypothetically think will work. And then we input that into a simulation and then see if it actually works as uh, we desire. So we basically check if it um, satisfies the system's goals that we de define during requirements. So if it satisfies, all and good, but this is usually a very highly iterative process. And so we go through this over and over again until the point where we reach the mechanism where which actually satisfies the system goals. Okay, so let's go through a little bit of conceptual groundwork. Um, I'm not sure how many of you guys were here for the entire um, day, but I want to lay the conceptual groundwork for some of the things, and these were actually covered in previous talks, so if you want to um, refer to those, you can, as, you can do that as well. So the first one I want to talk about is configuration spaces. So configuration spaces is typically a concept that is used very widely in robotics, and it's basically um, reducing the dimensionality of a given state space. So a given state space basically describes any kind of um, the set of all the things that can that this, this that the system can take place as a state. So so um, but that is usually quite high dimensional, and we don't want to deal with a high, high dimensionality because then the the problem becomes extremely complex. So in order to you know actually analyze the system, we want to reduce the dimensionality of that system. Um, so what we do is we impose constraints. And typically these constraints can be either in the form of like artificially imposed constraints, or we can have, we can identify analytically some natural constraints, which uh, we can call as conservation laws of the system. So it's very, very much akin to like the laws of motions in physics. There are some things that are just like naturally impossible to happen. And those apply to economic systems as well um, by design. So we can call that um, the constraint on the system. And once we imply, apply those constraints, we can reduce the configuration space, and then we get this subset, which is of a smaller dimension compared to the general state space, which is the configuration space. So here, um, the XC is a configuration space, whereas the bigger X here is the general state, state space. Another one that I also want to motivate is um, how we can use any kind of economic game as an estimator. So usually, um, typically with estimation theory, we, we can apply um, estimation theory in order to get a sense of what agents are thinking. So previously I talked about um, the fact that there is tons of uncertainty within the system because uh, all of the agents are constantly um, making decisions based on their private beliefs, right? And that is uh, the part where I talked about like the non-equilibrium notion of economic systems and how they're um, exposed to induction, which is done by the agents. So. So each one of these agents here actually has 
their own private belief of a certain piece of information. And let's consider, for example, that this piece of information is price, right? Um, say you are in an economic system, you have your own notion of how much you value uh, or how much you would pay for a specific item. So that is price and that is private to you because that's what you believe. Um, it might not necessarily be reflected in the real system. And so each one of these agents has their own notion of how much they would pay for a certain, certain um, object. So, so they have this private information, but that is not actually known to the system itself. So how do we get that information? So the way we get this information is that whenever an agent is placing an action on the system, whenever he performs an action on the system, then they're actually revealing their private information or their private belief of the price. So once they reveal that, we can actually take that as a signal because that is their true belief of what the price is. And we can take that as a signal and we can put it under an estimator, which is basically um, it takes inputs of all of the private beliefs of all of the agents. And then the estimator would estimate like the system level um, price estimate, which is basically um, the combination or culmination of some form of all of the private beliefs of the agents. So that way we're actually able to get an estimate of what the price, like the true price of the system is. It's not actually the true price because the true price doesn't exist, but we can only make estimates of the of the price because the price is essentially a culmination of, or the price signal is a culmination of what every single agent in the system believes the price to be. So how, um, so now we're actually going to be applying um, these concepts to a um, particular um, kind of bond called an impact bond. So the impact bond is essentially um, a bond, which is a debt, in debt instrument, but it's called an impact bond because it's typically applied to social impact investing um, applications. And an impact bond is also an outcome dependent funding mechanism, meaning that the repayment to investors at the end of this bond, or like when you're cashing out the bond, is uh, dependent on how successful the bond is. So in the context of the project, um, essentially we have a bond which consists of multiple social impact projects. These social impact projects essentially are time bounded and they will start at one point and then after the end, the investors um, investing in that project will be paid out depending upon how successful the bond is. So it is outcome depending funding and this is something that we will explore further and um, see what kind of um, privatives we can apply from crypto economics. So one of the things that we're applying from crypto economics is that of bonding curves. Um, so one thing to note here is when we're talking about bond bonding in here, to bond, it means to buy into the bonding curve, whereas here the bond actually meant bond as a debt, debt instrument. So just be, um, be aware of that distinction when we're talking about this further. So. So here, to bond means to buy into the bonding curve. So basically, bonding curve is a mechanism to distribute tokens in a crypto economic system, and the tokens can be issued or burned through buy and sell functions. So whenever you would buy or bond into the system or bond into the bonding curve, then you are buying reserve tokens. And if you are, um, if you are burning or selling, then you are essentially giving away um, your reserve tokens. So that's how this bonding curve works and but it does have a few shortcomings as it currently exists today some, some implementations have these shortcomings so um some of them actually or most of them today have fixed a priori assumptions so that makes all of these bonding curves static meaning that once you execute the bond you can't actually account for certain factors so let's see how we apply bonding curves curves to impact bonds social impact bonds so uh, let's talk a little bit more about the problem with, um, you know, current implementations of bonding curves, which is that because of the fixed a priori assumptions, which means, so when I start a bond, I would typically make certain assumptions about um, how the bond is going to behave and like what kind of, um, you know, reserve to supply ratio it's going to be and all such things. And I will fix them at the beginning. Um, and once I fix that, then I will move on to execution. Now, during execution, it's typically not common practice to change anything. So 
the bonding curve is not able to account for any external factors. It's not able to incorporate risk. It's not able to incorporate any new information that is thrown at it during its live execution phase. So as a result of that, um, the tokens that are within the bonding curve get misallocated. And sometimes if there are too many external risks, then these risks also accumulate non-linearly because you have sometimes uh, mechanisms that are compounding, like um, so sometimes tokens within within the reserve are used as collateral for other things. And so then you have this compounding nonlinear effect of where the risk just accumulates. And if that happens too much, then the system will actually collapse. Um, but it's not extremely common. What's more common is the token misallocation. Um, and during these token misallocations, if they do get sufficiently mis misallocated, then the investors will not get a good return on their investment. So these are not very nice properties. And so we want to account for these properties by creating some sort, sort of like a dynamic bonding curve that can account for risk during its execution. So, so we know that the success of an impact bond is highly dependent on the execution of the bond. And so, so the success of an impact bond is essentially going to be determined during the execution phase of the bond. So, during the execution phase is when we can actually gain new information about the system um, because it is the longest phase. And we can also get um, external information such as how much risk the project is going to face or if there are some other external com completely secondary factors which also affect the bond, then we are able to collect all of this information and dynamically change that um, success likelihood of the impact bond based on the information we get. So, Instead of setting the bond's likelihood of success as an a priori assumption, right, at the start of the bond, we instead, what we do is we continuously estimate the bond's likelihood of success based on what all of the agents think, um, based on what all of the participants in, this, in the project think. Um, so, so we're dynamically adjusting the bonding curve um, based on all of the internal and external inputs. And thus we get a risk adjusted bonding curve, which is what we're going to be exploring further. So how do we engineer this outcome dependent bonding mechanism, which is that of a risk adjusted bonding curve is what we're using uh, as an instrument to, um, to deploy a outcome dependent funding mechanism. Cool. So the first thing we do in the engineering design process of this is um, establishing system boundary and interfaces. So um, the system is actually, if you consider any system, you can essentially go far out enough where, to the point where you're not able to collect enough information for um, a good enough guarantee of, uh, of certainty in order to, um, you know, do analytical work in your system. So you need to establish a boundary such that it only encompasses the part of the system which you are extremely sure about and which will suffice for the purposes of your design. So we established this system boundary as considering mostly only one bond, uh, which consists of multiple projects. We're not con considering the bond portfolio, which is essentially, if I were an investor, I will invest in multiple impact bonds and each of these impact bonds will have their own projects. But that level is not something we're considering because then you have other external factors to also think about, which are typically in the meat space, it's in the real world, and we don't have like reliable ways to measure it. So we established a system boundary to be considering only of one bond at the bond level. And then we also have to think about how to um, break down this, um, this the, the machine, which is um, consisting of the bond through all of its stages of um, pre-initialization to initialization all the way to close out. We have to um, figure out essentially how to represent it in a way that actually would help us um, simplify it and take it onto an engineering process. So typically you can use any number of tools or any number of representations. So for this one, we went, we went with the finite state machine because it did seem to us that the bond had a lot of different states and these could be measured. It was finite, meaning that it didn't change with um, different implementations, it was typically following the same kind of um, pattern of um, having all of these six phases. And so we described it as a finite state machine. So let's see what a finite state machine is. So finite state machine basically uh, consists of multiple states. You can describe a 
machine as having multiple states. And each state has its inputs, it has outputs, and it also has um, certain state transition events. So these state transition events are described here. And so basically, if I were in the pre-initialization phase and I wanted to move to the initialization phase, then I would need to satisfy the state transition condition, which is I would have to acquire a certain amount of funding. And once I do that, then I will move on to the initialization phase. So we have conditions, um, conditionally um, varying state transitions, as well as inputs and outputs to every single state. And sometimes we also have external inputs. So these are the ones that we will also consider in the next stages. Okay, then we move on to system requirements because now we want to think about the entire system. And typically, I will tell you, if you're going through this process, you will not arrive at the system requirements right off the bat. You will only arrive at the system requirements after you do sufficient exploration of the system and you are able to detail other aspects of the system, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then this is typically a highly iterative process. And oftentimes, your system requirements just emerge out of you finding out about a certain facet of the system or a certain mechanism. So the system requirements that we finally came to um, came for this system is that the bonding curve state must be reflected. So um, essentially, we have these um, claims and disputes within our bonding curve, which is basically um, agents or participants in the bond saying that, hey, I will bet that this bond will be successful and I will bet like 10 tokens on that. So they typically bond if, or they typically bet if the bond will be successful or if it fail and, and therein they have to reflect the state of the bonding curve. So that is the first system requirement. And then the second system requirement is that every single um, mechanism in the economic layer should incentivize agent behavior so that it achieves system goals. And the system goals, the ones that we defined during the um, initial system requirement phase. And then the third one is that the agents have a constrained action space. And you will see a little bit more about why we have constrained the action space. It's because of the fact that there are a lot of conflict of interest. So if I'm a certain type of agent, I don't want to be involved in, in activities that will um, essentially conflict the interest of the system goal. So we'll see that a little bit further. Now we define the roles and agents. Um, so the roles are essentially these gray boxes and there are several roles here, as you can see. Um, the reason why we actually defined um, agents, agent classes as well, is because we wanted to simplify this just down to the very, very necessary components of um, what is required. So, so roles are several because um, these roles are, essentially exactly a replica of what exists within the system, the participants that exist within the system. However, um, certain, um, certain participants essentially just perform the same similar kind of action. So we have grouped them based on their actions. So there is only one kind of um, agent within the system that can perform trading uh, of tokens. So that is the investment agent. And then there are these agents, service agent, bond issuer, project owner, outcomes fair, as well as the investment agent who um, issue claims and disputes. And those are basically the ones that I was talking about earlier where um, they are issuing or they are betting that the project will succeed or fail. Um, so those are the claims and dispute issuers. And then there's the outcome spare who does the final disburb disbursement of funds once the project is complete. And then there's also evaluators which um, evaluate these claims and, um, you know, they say if it's if it's valid and they resolve those claims and resolve res resolve disputes as well. So all, the evaluators are very essential in maintaining and reflecting the state of the bonding curve, which was our first system requirement, if you remember. And then we have operational requirements. So these operational requirements are based uh, um, a lot on the roles and the agents that we define. So let's take a look at it. So Operational requirements are basically a way to constrain your action space um, so that um, it's a smaller set of things that an agent can do compared to all of the possible actions that it can take. 
um, we establish these operational requirements so that we um, establish a notion for um, all of the permissible actions that a particular agent can take. So for example, uh, we have traders which can only bond or burn tokens. Um, as a result of that, since they are actively involved in trading, they cannot evaluate, audit, or resolve claims. Because if they do that, then they will essentially be self-serving. And if they are self-serving, then it can lead to us not being able to achieve the system goals. So likewise, um, the people that submit claims and disputes should also not be able to simultaneously evaluate, audit, or resolve their own claims and disputes, because then we'll be also resolving the disputes or claims that they submitted by themselves. So you, you don't want those kinds of conflicts of interest to arise. So that's why we impose operational requirements. And the nice thing about this is that it also like minimizes the action space. So, so given an agent class, uh, we can essentially establish a sort of legality or permission, a permission system for what actions a given agent class can take. So then we get the action space, which is what is defined in the second column right here. Okay, now we talk about the mechanisms. So the mechanisms are essentially, if I were to give a broad definition for it, it's um, the economic um, design patterns that will help the system achieve its system goals. Um, so the first mechanism that we have here is the bond to mint mechanism. So when an agent is bonding, um, that means they are transferring a quantity of the reserve tokens um, or the bond tokens, which are transferred into the bonding curve. So it's a good thing. So these tokens are basically converted from fiat or stablecoin or DAI or any other um, external currency or external token. And then they are converted into bond tokens and put into the reserve of the bonding curve. And then we have um, the burn to withdraw, which is when impact tokens or essentially um, fiat currency or um, stable coin is removed from the bonding curve. So it actually loses out on the, the amount of reserve tokens that are within the bonding curve. And then we have attestations, um, which is when the agents will essentially um, bet that the bond will succeed or fail depending upon their belief of um, the bond's high, like, likelihood of success. And so based on the mechanisms, we can define functional requirements. So if you see that there are actually um, some patterns occurring here, when we had roles and agents, we are able to um, define operational requirements out of the roles and agents. And now when we have mechanisms, we can define functional requirements over the mechanisms because mechanisms perform the function of the system and operational requirements um, are related to roles. So now for these functional requirements, um, the first functional requirement we asked is that uh, the system must be robust enough to account for catastrophic risks that occur in the extremes of the curve. So in the bonding curve, we have um, the left extreme as well as the right extreme, which, um, which is when a lot of um, essentially compounding effects can happen and that often results in systemic collapse. But we have to make certain guarantees such that those do not occur. So we have to require that the system is robust. And then we also have um, the basic functionality needs to be also a requirement, which is to insert or remove tokens. Um, so we have to design a system that actually bonds and burns when the, um, yeah, that actually performs the bond and burn action properly. So whenever a bond action is performed, it should insert tokens into the bonding curve. And when a burn action is performed, it should remove tokens from the bonding curve. So that's the basic functionality of the system. That's why it's functional requirement. Anyway, um, then we have the third requirement, which is something that we considered um, because of the fact that humans are interacting with the system. So investors and all of the other agents are also going to be humans. So humans have this tendency to think, or it's a bias that, you know, if there's no activity for a long time in any given system, then we think that the system is slowly starting to die. But we don't want that to happen within the system because that's a temporal consideration, which we can think about perhaps in a later iteration. But for the sake of um, analytically going about this, we want to guarantee that the lack of activity within this bond does not imply degradation. So for example, if 
no one trades for a given amount of time, like say for a long time, such as a month or something, then um, it should not imply that the bond's likelihood of success goes down. Okay, then we have this um, notion of conservation functions. Earlier, I was talking about the laws of motion of economics, right? So this is what we mean by conservation functions. So conservation functions are essentially where we identify certain properties that are invariant within the system or certain parameters that are invariant within the system. And then we impose a function over it so that we can, we can make the state space smaller and turn it into a configuration space of a much smaller dimension. So whenever you take any conservation functions, so for example, here, what we have set is that the price at the start of the system, no, no the, the ratio uh, between the reserve and supply at the start of the system is going to be conserved throughout um, the execution of the system as well. And that is our conservation function. And when we apply this conservation function over a generalized state space, then it becomes a much smaller dimension configuration space. So we arrive at our configuration space. And then it becomes a lot easier to tackle as well. And then we also see an application of the economic games as estimators uh, for this, which is that the game itself, the economic game that all of the agents are playing in order to participate in the bond, either to you know, bond or burn tokens, such as do trading, or if they are attesting that um, a project will fail or pass, it is um, all a game. And it can be considered that all of these agents are actually just performing actions, uh, which are actions within a game. And uh, once they do perform an action, then it is a signal that we obtain, which we can put into our estimator and then obtain an estimate of their private beliefs. So let's go through this again, um, where each agent here has a private belief of their likelihood of of has a private belief of alpha. And alpha is their belief of the likelihood that the project will succeed or the bond will succeed. And so say this agent one thinks that the bond has a very high likelihood of succeeding, then then the fact when they attest that the project will succeed or they bet that um, the project will succeed into the system, then they're revealing their belief that they think that it will succeed with a 90% chance of success. And that information we can extract as a signal for our estimator. And then when we put this signal into the estimator along with the other signals that we have received from other agents actions, then we are able to obtain essentially a culmination of all of these signals that we've gotten from different agents, and then we can estimate our system alpha. Because truly, um, the system alpha doesn't actually exist until you make, make of it what it is. So what we made it to be is a culmination of the private beliefs of all of the different agents. Right, so um, whenever an agent makes an action, then they reveal their private belief of alpha. And as a result, we can take that all as signals and signals are actually um, true. It's actually considered truer data. And then once we obtain the signal, then we are able to make an estimate, which is not exactly true data, but it is an estimate because there is no true data. Okay, um, so in this entire um, presentation, what we've just talked about is how to apply certain conceptual elements of complexity theory, complex systems, and as well as certain newer concepts, such as configuration spaces, uh, as well as economic games being estimators, which are both papers written by um, Sargam and Parikh, which, which are both giving talks in today's session or tomorrow's session. And, and these concepts, when applied to impact bonds, social impact bonds, are extremely powerful in determining, as well as designing a system which can, which is composed of outcome dependent funding mechanisms. So outcome dependent funding mechanisms are so applicable here is because of the fact that um, the likelihood of success of a bond is essentially so highly dependent on the signals that a bond receives during its execution phase. 
which is why the estimators really applies here. And configuration spaces also help us really decrease the dimensionality of the system, thereby simplifying our problem in a much greater extent. Because if you had seen our um, diagrams when we first explored this problem, the fact that this is such a socially rooted um, problem space makes it extremely hard to get reliable information and make computations out of those, right? And we are actually going to be throwing this into a simulation after performing all of this analysis and then after building a mathematical model, we are going to be throwing this into a simulation. And when we want to simulate this, we don't want to be simulating it using, um, using things that involve a high degree of uncertainty. So in order to decrease that and in order to make our simulation as realistic, as, as accurate to reality as possible, we want to decrease our um, state space to a much smaller configuration space. And we also want to obtain estimates for things such as price, for things such as alpha, which is the likelihood of success of a bond, so that we are able to get their values because their values don't exist until you compute them from the private beliefs of what the agents participating in the system think of them to be. Um, okay, and um, if you would like to see any much more of this work, then we have it all at um, Block Science slash Interchain Foundation on GitHub. And so definitely do check it out. We're continuously going to be posting. We just posted our first, first phase, which is a phase one. And in the future, we'll be posting phase two involving all the simulations and phase three as well, which is all of the experiments that we're going to do um, on the system. Yeah. So thank you and stay virtual. Cool. Thanks a lot, Fruity, for this awesome talk. Um, if you have questions, just now reach out and let us know in the chat or uh, in the Discord chat, uh, post your question here. Do we have anybody who wants to raise a question in in the channel here? Okay, no one at the moment. I can't wait to raise a question. Then I just go ahead. Um, Fruti, I have a question uh, regarding the boundaries of the system. So mm -hmm. you said, okay, um, the, the unfortunate thing with most of the bonding curves is that they are static. Let's include information to update it and um, to, well, don't have, have this static system. Now I'm wondering, okay, you mentioned that you limit the, the space of actions for agents, for example, with implementing a betting system. But could it be also something else, an external source like an oracle? Right, yeah, actually we do have an oracle that initially um, obtains a value of alpha. So, mm -hmm. so um, before the system is initialized, um, we set the value of the success of the bond um, mm -hmm. using a pre-initialized alpha. And usually that alpha is obtained from an oracle, which takes into consideration inputs such as, oh, what kind of a sector is this bond coming from? Is it going to, is it something such as epidemics, which has a high degree of applicability, so it has a high degree of obtaining funding and high degree of success and things of that sort. So we do have an oracle before the system, um, before the system initializes to that gives us a value of alpha to start with and once the system starts we will be updating the value of alpha depending upon how this agents within the system bet on its success okay and then the oracle um data is going to be rem removed or not not updated anymore or how do, do you deal with that we will have a um, have a portion of alpha be updating um, based on the Oracle data, mm -hmm. but we're not considering that for this stage of the system because of the fact that um, the function which the Oracle is dependent on is extremely complex and mm -hmm. depends on several external factors, which we won't be able to obtain information for when we're simulating. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we will be considering it only as some sort of like a small um, randomized thing that will influence alpha when the project is doing execution. Okay. And then how to set the boundaries of the system. Um, so I would assume that, okay, you have definitely the, the Oracle is an external system, but at the same time, we have many examples um, today where you have this, uh, well, tight interconnectedness between the systems. So I, I, I feel that 
setting the boundaries of the system can be a tricky thing. Yeah, it's certainly tricky because of the fact that we have to consider um, whether we want to set um, I mean, there, there's two ways in which to set system boundaries, like one is spatially, which is what we've shown here, but we also have to set like temporal boundaries, which I think which is where like it gets more complicated because temporal boundaries basically mean they convey dependencies, right? The system is going to be dependent on the external alpha oracle, mm. right? And that that link actually conveys a dependency, but we're not considering in this in this one because of the fact that the external alpha oracle is extremely, depends on an extremely complex function. Mm -hmm. um, so it does convey those dependencies, but for the sake of simplicity, we have not essentially considered that. But I would say that when you know other engineers are going about this problem, definitely consider, um, consider where the highest degrees of dependencies lie. And if at all it's possible to include or incorporate the um, stages of the system where there is a high degree of dependency, then definitely do so, you know, given the bounds of how much complexity it adds to your, um, to your design problem. Mm. Okay. Um, I didn't notice exactly, but is this um, code and simulations, are they open sourced? Uh, yes, actually, okay. uh, we can go through. Um, so we have written all of the mathematical modeling stuff so mm -hmm. far and it's all up here. So we have three chapters here. Wait, are you able to see my screen still? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. Um, so we have oh, three yeah, chapters yeah. where we have um, defined ecosystem roles, uh, which is all the roles of the agents. And then we have defined the phases as a finite state machine. And then we have also defined the engineering requirements. And this is um, the meat of the document. So a lot of the engineering process is demonstrated here. So we have the system boundary, we have described the system requirements, um, described also the state space of the system, which is essentially all of the state variables that will change continually during the execution phase. Um, we have defined a bunch of terms that we use, um, such as reserve supply alpha, um, which pop up a lot within the project, as well as um, in traditional bonding curves and establish initialization conditions for the system as well as close out conditions. And um, yeah, and, and then describe the mechanisms more mathematically. So mm -hmm. you can find it all here. And soon we will also be pushing out our phase two, um, which will include a lot of derivations around um, how we will arrive at a few more conservation functions. We want to, we want to also implement a conservation function around um, the total payout that's going to be made towards the end of the project, the fact that that is actually a conserved quantity as well. Mm -hmm. So we want to express that also as a conservation function. So there are the derivations according to associated with all of those will be posted soon in the same um, repo as well. Brilliant. So yeah, I've, I've included this repo here. Um, okay. Yeah, so if you would like to take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect, brilliant. And we have a question in the chat. So um, Phil is asking, can external prediction markets be used as oracles for estimators? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so if you would like to plug in your oracle prior to the start of the system, then you can definitely also use an external prediction market. But if you add it to during the execution phase, like if you plug in your external prediction market signal and and channel it directly to the execution phase, then that might add a little bit of complexity, which will influence um, essentially your alpha update. Because right now the alpha update is solely based on um, what the participants, what the participants are um, think of as being being the alpha. So yeah, so that all of the derivations um, associated with alpha will change if you um, incorporate an external oracle or an external prediction market. Um, directly to the execution phase. But if you incorporate it at the initialization phase or pre-initialization phase um, to feed into the starting alpha or the initial alpha, then you should be good. Okay, good. Any more questions? Let us know in the chat. We have a couple of minutes left. Okay, maybe um, if there isn't any other question. I would love to 
No. So you are working on this project with Interchain Foundation. Can you give us a picture of the team uh, and the different roles or backgrounds who are working on this modeling um, project? Yeah, so uh, so we're essentially forming an interface between um, Block Science and Interchain Foundation. I work with the Block Science team of, um, so it's myself, Matt Barlin, who is our systems engineer, as well as Michael Zargam, who's our systems architect, and Nick um, Heronet, as well as, um, yeah, and we have a few folks like Gal and Harry who are helping out on the business requirements side. So, so the engineering team is essentially myself, Matt, and Michael, mm -hmm. and then we have our interface with Interchain Foundation, who is Billy Renekamp from ICF. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that forms the team, and we also actually work with um, very closely, actually, with IXO, and mm -hmm. IXO is the use case that we're like rooting this under. So, um, the impact bonds, the social impact bonds, is something that IXO is um, developing. And within IXO, there's um, this person called Sean, who yeah. we have a lot of, I think it's actually giving a talk next. So, so yeah. I think, yeah, I'll take a look at the schedule. Sean is definitely on our list. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, he's going to talk at five. Um, next is the talk of Sherman, and then Sean is introducing IXO. So it's a perfect, <laughs> perfect um, sequence and addition to your talk. Yeah, he's going to be good, diving really deep into the actual use case of um, impact bonds and how you know risk adjusted impact bonds are applicable. So yeah, his talk should be very interesting as well. Cool. So many thanks. We will definitely share the links to the Gitcoin repository and happy to see the next round of your work published. Thanks a lot for uh, being here and uh, talk to you soon. You too. Thank you for hosting and everyone have a great time and stay safe. Stay safe. Bye. All right. Cheers. Bye. Okay. For everyone who is going to stay, um, there will be a 10 minutes break in, in our schedule. So I think you can see it, everyone. Uh, we have our next talk, 10 past four, Sherman Forschung Gear, Purpose Driven Tokens, and then, as mentioned, John Conway from IXO talking about impact bonds and we have a program until eight or past eight tonight with additional talks on cryptoeconomics 